Today's story of a man will be titled Spy Planes and Overflights. And to set the stage, General Eisenhower was the President of the United States and he needed information about Russia. And the uh, Central Intelligence Agency was the only one who could get money in order to fund the uh, spy operation and overflight. This is, a, is the uh, story as told by the CIA. Now at the time, the CIA was unable to uh, do any flying, but they were the only ones that could have money that Congress didn't know about. And General Eisenhower uh, decided that he would set up a group with the CIA and they would in turn uh, use the Air Force to fly the missions. But because the CIA did not want the Air Force to get any credit, they refused to allow the Air Force to be a part of the initial startup. Eisenhower had other plans. So in 1955, I went to England to study with the inventors of radar by the uh, English scientist. And that's the beginning of my start with electronic countermeasures. I came back and at the end of the year, President Eisenhower contacted uh, uh, my boss and told him that I, ne I was needed uh, at, in California to help on a project that had to do with uh, uh, meteorological things. And so I went to California in 1955 and I was sent out uh, to uh, study. Well, when I got there, I was flown to Area 51. That's the out in the uh, desert. And it was a very, very, very top secret organization. President Eisenhower set up this organization. This organization reads from the top, the President of the United States. And under that is a Technological Capabilities Panel Advisory Committee, and it had a steering committee, and he made the one of that Dr. J.R. Killian. He was the only one that could talk to President Eisenhower. He was our spokesman. None of us knew who the others were. My boss at, uh, Di uh, at uh, Sweetport, Mosier City, Dice, uh, oh, Marksdale Air Force Base, he did not know what my job was. And I couldn't tell him. When I got there to the meeting, it was a very high level meeting. Uh, one of them was uh, Jimmy Doolittle, General Jimmy Doolittle. He's the one who flew the raid on Tokyo. And the next one was Edwin Land. He invented the Polaroid. And as we began the first meeting, getting acquainted, uh, we were told only that what we were going to be working on uh, as an overall plan but we none of us would know what each other was doing. We couldn't even tell another project officer. Yep. And so when they got back, when Dr. Killian went back and talked uh, to uh, General Eisenhower, nothing could be written down. It all had to be eyes only, which meant that you could not talk about it, you could not, and it was all eyes only. And 
He told him, he's, this Dr. Killian told General Eisenhower, the president, we had this room full of experts, but we had two young uh, geniuses, is what he called them, bright young men that knew more than all of them put together. At that, at then, President Eisenhower said, okay, I want them to be on Project 3. That's this Project 3 right here. And this Project 3, he didn't know what we were going to be doing. He just told us by, uh, through Dr. Killian, that we were to be responsible for all of the uh, electronics and, and uh, cameras and, and, the, and the things that would go in in gathering information about Russia. And we were not to tell even him what we, had, what we were coming up with. We were to come up with the information and the way to employ it. And on that one, Edwin uh, H. Land was the director. So we, we began our, our meetings and we came up with what was called the U2 project. And in that one, I had the opportunity, and this is told by the CIA, so it has nothing to do with the Air Force in it at all. I'm, I'm not even, as far as I know, but this was whenever General, or not General, uh, when uh, Kelly uh, was given uh, five months, only five months to come up with a, a platform, an aircraft of some kind that would uh, fly over uh, Russia and gather information. And, and uh, Kelly, was the one who had the skunk works. And so I had the opportunity to be briefed by uh, Kelly and work with him for the five months. And uh, the only thing that he, he really said was, I will never work with the Navy. That was one of his things. But he did make it and they used the, uh, they built the U-2 and it was called U for utility. And it was to be, our cover was that it was to be used as a uh, meteorological, weather balloons and that kind of thing. And during that period of time, not even, not even land, no one else knew, not my boss, not anybody uh, knew what I, what I did. That's where we took the, uh, uh, each one of the boxes on the uh, U-2 was just an ordinary box that you could put a camera in, you could put all of the information gathering equipment. Uh, and we did not have uh, uh, recorders at that time of any kind, tape recorders or anything. So we took a banjo string, uh, A, and wrapped it on a cord, uh, reel to reel, and made a recorder, wire recorder. And that's the wire recorder that I listened to uh, as it, as the aircraft, the U-2, flew over Russia a number of times uh, in 1956. Uh, uh, and in 1956, uh, I had gathered uh, enough information that no one knew what we had. And I listened to the tapes and I had another a gentleman with me, another uh, uh, young captain, a lieutenant, another lieutenant, and we listened to it. And we used those then to uh, fly in the, uh, uh, this, this right here, flight over Russia during the Suez crisis, 1956. He, he President Eisenhower, said, would you please, uh, uh, tell the young man flies over Russia and blinds him to thumb his nose at him, and I did. And that concludes the story of the uh, spy planes and overflights was when we caused the Russians, I flew over them four times, and I did in fact thumb my nose at them, and we still uh, went on to be another story at another time, but 
it'll be told from the Air Force side because uh, the Air Force was not allowed to be a part of that. So ends the story of spy planes and overflights. <laughs>